And this is a photograph of two right whales from, taken from the air off the coast of Argentina. And these are animals that have been hunted to near extinction in numerous parts of the world. And I was particularly interested in what they were saying. In this species, males do not sing. They call. They communicate over 20 miles or so, not very, very long distances, but decent distances. And they use the call to form aggregations, social aggregations, mating aggregations. And in certain parts of the world, they use it to aggregate on food resources. You can't hear these animals as far away as you can, say, a, a singing blue whale or a singing humpback. It's harder to detect them. So their social communication world is much smaller than these deep-voiced animals such as the blue whale. But they do communicate, and we have great uh, new stories to tell about how this communication works because I've been using my own equipment in the same way that I was using the Navy's submarine listening systems to track blue whales. I've been using the same technique, only with our technology, to study right whales. So here we have Cape Cod Bay. This is a small peninsula that sticks out from Massachusetts. And in this case, I have five recorders that I've placed on the bottom of the ocean. These are basically just sound recorders, and they're synchronized. And then when a whale makes a sound, I can locate where the whale is. So I will position a calling whale with a yellow dot, and then there's a little clock up here, and you'll see how many positions I get, and by animating this, this, um, these data, you'll actually see what look like little worms moving through space, and those represent the calling of right whales in Cape Cod Bay starting at midnight on the 2nd of April. So here is, and I'll start right here, there's a calling whale, oh, there's another one. Now it's about 2 o'clock in the morning, and two of these animals that are about to join up are counter-calling. You call, I call. You call, I call. And this is how these animals maintain the social network, how they maintain their contact and coordinate their activities. Now it's about 4.30 in the morning, and any self-respecting scientist is in bed asleep and now it's pretty much over. And I became much more interested in what about all the shipping that we're doing? What about all these ships that come through and how much noise they put into the ocean? And what is it really, what is it doing for the habitat in which these animals live and upon which they depend? And in this case, the habitat is the sound habitat. It's the acoustic habitat. It's not the visual habitat. You're not looking for trees and tree holes and bushes and berries. You're listening to your world because that's how you perceive your world. The challenge was, how do I take all this ship traffic that's going overhead, all the noise from the ship traffic, which we have all the data on it, we know how loud they are, we know how fast they're going. How do we take that and convert it into some sense of what's it like to be a whale? living in the ocean with all this noise. What happens if I look at this over a day or a month or a long period of time with all the ships, not just one ship, and not just one whale, but all the whales that are there? So this is what we've now done. And this is my Van Gogh. He, each one of these glowing lights represents the voice of a whale and the extent of the light represents the space over which that whale can communicate. So the larger the glow, the larger the space. And you'll notice that these little flickers, they're not really, really huge, because a right whale, in this case, even in modern times, without the ships, the known ships, it still can only communicate out to maybe 10 miles or so. So here we have a lot of whales here. There was a lot of food right here off of Provincetown, so there's a lot of whales. And there are fewer whales distributed out further away. And you'll see them move around in a slightly random, semi-random kind of way. And on top of that, what you're going to see is you're going to see initially three ships come out of Boston Harbor and go down towards the Cape Cod Canal. 
And then you're going to see this light coming in from up in the northeast. And it's the light, it's the footprint, the acoustic footprint of a commercial ship coming into Boston. And when the light from the ship overwhelms the light from the whale, that means that the whale has lost its entire ability to be heard or to communicate. Here goes the animation. There are the ships coming out of Boston. Here comes the big commercial ship from Europe. So notice, the whales disappear. That means down here, they still have some chances to communicate. Up here, they've lost it all. Now this is, I'm just showing you several days. Look at all the whales that can no longer communicate. Of all those whales that are in this space, for this one period of time, this is a 10 minute section of time, how much of the space have they lost? How much of that opportunity to communicate have they lost? And we're plotting that over a one month period of time. And this shows the 1st of April all the way to the 1st of May. And this number here is a number between 0 and 1. And if it's 1, that means nobody can hear me. And if it's 0, everything's fine. Everybody can hear me. And notice that the blue, that value goes up and down and up and down. And it's as though, look at here, it goes, it's perfectly clear for a couple of hours. And then wham, it gets very, very noisy again. 85% of the whales can't hear each other. Then it goes back down again. Then it goes up again. Then it goes down again, up again. So think of this as the social fabric. The, the way we are actually able to communicate and maintain our society is constantly being ripped apart, back and forth, back and forth. It's all because of commercial shipping. And on average, right whales lose 84% of their opportunities to communicate day after day after day after day. And the consequences? Well, we don't exactly know. But we do know that if they can't hear each other, they don't aggregate. And they typically aggregate around food, and they typically aggregate around mating opportunities. I had a second opportunity this last year where I was asked to participate in a workshop with the National Park Service, the superintendent of national parks from Colorado and the superintendent of a particular national park called Glacier Bay which is an absolutely beautiful fjord in southeast Alaska, which over the last 200 years has been melting, and the glacier has moved its way up hundreds of miles up this uh, fjord. And humpback whales come into the fjord, spend their summers there feeding and carrying on and singing, as self-respecting humpbacks will do. But this is also a place where people love to go because it is so just absolutely spectacular, and the superintendent of the National Park had to make a decision to let in more cruise ships or not let in more cruise ships. I had lots of figures and graphs and tables and whatnot, and finally had this aha moment like, why? Why don't we make an animation, in this case, two figures? Here in blue, is the outline of the water of the Glacier Bay National Park. And the dots represent humpback whales. And the scientists in the National Park who have been studying these whales for 20 years or more had the information, had the data on how many whales there would be and how they would distribute it around the National Park. And for two years we worked with them and we had placed those recorders on the bottom of the fjord and recorded the ships going overhead. So they had the, the license plate numbers and the IDs and everything of those ships, and we had their sounds. It was like, wait a minute, we can make an authentic movie of the soundscape and the scene in that park with and without ships. So that's what we've done. This is wind noise and whales. So this is wind and whales. And this is wind and whales and ships. So I'll show you an animation. You'll see the little glows of small ships. These are 300 passenger day boats. And then you'll see a very large glow come in and enter the park. And that's the footprint, the acoustic footprint of a cruise ship carrying roughly 5,000 people into the park. So those are the day boats.
going up the fjord, here comes the large cruise ship. Cruise ships are designed to be quiet because no one likes to get in a cruise ship, especially if you're paying for a stateroom and have your mind rattled for day after day after day. So they are deliberately, they're about a thousand times quieter than a normal ship. So look at the difference between without the ships and with the ships. So when this little animation was over, that was the end of my talk, and the superintendent of Glacier Bay sat there quietly for just a second, and then she turned to the audience. There were maybe 25 people in the room. It was a small gathering. And she said, this has been a marvelous workshop. I've learned so much about Glacier Bay, my park, that I'm a superintendent of which I'm a superintendent. Um, but I'm not a scientist, and so much of what you told me, I really don't understand. I'm a lawyer, but I understand that. And then she turned and made eye contact with the superintendent from Colorado. And it was as though you're just watching the, you know, the ESP happening. And there again, the hair went up on the back of my neck, and I said to myself, she got it. She understood from an authentic animation of scientific material, she understood the whole idea of an acoustic footprint, of an acoustic habitat, of an acoustic ecology. And then she turned to me and she said, so if I was to ask you could you tell me what the impact would be on the park if I let in 33 more ships a summer? And I remember my mind churning and going, oh boy. Now as a scientist, I should not answer that question. Or I should certainly qualify it with lots of caveats and ifs and thans and what ifs. But I didn't do that. I just looked at her. And I said, yes, ma'am. That was the end of the conversation. And she went and made the decision to control the number of ships in the national park. And to me, that was, that was such an emotional moment. And it, it lasted, it's lasted many, many months, as a matter of fact, to realize, wow, that's one of our responsibilities as scientists because I have the luxury to be a scientist. I have the luxury to be a scientist at Cornell University. And this is, carries with it a responsibility to communicate what I learn and what I understand and to translate that into basic messages about the health of this planet and how we have a responsibility to enable that health to continue.